Does that mean yes? Shall I just start? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, welcome to the last session of today. So we are happy to have uh, the most qualified person to talk about amplitudes, Lance, and he will talk about amplitudes bootstrap. All right. Thanks a lot. In some version of the schedule, it said I only have half an hour. That was a lie. <laughs> an hour might even be a lie, too. We'll see. So, uh, uh, yeah, I want to tell you about uh, uh, a technique called bootstrapping, which when it works, it works very, very well. So we are able to uh, calculate special amplitudes and special theories to seven or eight loops. If we were to try to do, or the state of the art for doing it in the real world, by which I mean QCD, is one or two loops. So it's pretty incredible how far you can go, at least in, in special theories. And uh, just to give you kind of a, a rough outline of how you often do uh, loop amplitudes, that's what we're going to be interested in here. We'll build off of some of the color and kinematic discussion we had earlier, but we're going to focus on loops. The uh, one, one way to do it would be to do Feynman diagrams. So you have some scattering process you're interested in, say with a lot of gluons, and you draw a lot of Feynman diagrams. And uh, the uh, amplitude, and each of, each of these Feynman diagrams, for every diagram D, you get some integrand, which is actually a rational function of the loop momenta for diagram D. And then you have to do a bunch of integrals over the uh, loop momenta, depending on how many you have. And then you get some piece of the amplitude, say AD. So the, the full amplitude is represented as a sum over diagrams with, uh, <coughs> labeled by their contribution AD where you had to do this loop integral over the some uh, function of the loop momenta. And these integrals are rather difficult to do. So that's step, that's option one. Another option would be uh, to do something more on shell. That's always a good idea. Uh, so, that would be something like uh, generalized unitarity. So instead of drawing all these Feynman diagrams, you kind of try to deduce what the rational function of the loop momenta is by using information from lower loops and lower numbers of legs. And uh, Yara's going to say more about this. Later, I'm just going to be very sketchy. Um, so like at one loop, you might uh, try to diagnose a scattering amplitude by uh, looking first at its quadruple cuts. And so you'll uh, figure out what the integrand is, and that integrand might be still summed over some class of things which would be different topologies like different types of integrals, like different box integrals maybe at one loop, and so on. And uh, so then you still have to construct uh, some answer AT, a which is an uh, integral over the loop momenta. Might be multi-loop. So that would be AT. And then the amplitude will be a sum over these topologies instead. But you'll notice in both cases, you have to do some integral over the loop momenta. And uh, Johannes Henn is going to talk at the end of the week about how to do loop integrals. But I'm going to spoil his series of lectures by telling you that loop integrals are hard. 
And <laughs> if you can avoid, avoid them, uh, you should. So, so the, uh, the bootstrap approach Actually, I decided another phrase for that would be the no-shell approach uh, instead of on-shell. It's close, but um, because what you do is you you don't look, you try not to look inside the loops as much as you can, and you you try to uh, instead build up the amplitude in a different way, and uh, the way you try to do it is. You uh, start by um, making a guess. See, it's guess and then check. Uh, you you have an amplitude, um, so you basically write a linear onsatz. So you have to figure out what the right kinematic variables are. So we'll just call these the UKs. Move this further away. So this is going to be some assumed a uh, set of functions. Yeah. Yeah, I started moving it away, but maybe not far enough. Okay, sorry. And then you want to constrain the um, uh, these unknown, these are uh, unknown. And, but they're generally rational numbers. And then you want to constrain them with whatever information you have. You might have uh, some uh, structural information we'll uh, talk about, uh, about some guess about the subspace uh, functions that this lies in. And you can also have uh, boundary information. And, and this uh, sort of uh, includes uh, factorization of the type uh, that uh, Shruti discussed in the BCFW context at tree level. There's also kinds of loop level factorization you can use. And then there's even some more sophisticated information that comes from uh, some all orders analysis of the operator uh, product expansion in the cases where we can do the bootstrapping. This boundary value information is there thanks to work of Basso, Sever, and uh, Vieira in the n-gluon amplitude context, and later work by uh, Sever and uh, Tumanoff and uh, Wilhelm. And this by itself is a very sophisticated uh, um, setup, this operator product expansion. So I'm not really going to describe it, it's except kind of at the level of a recipe book and uh, where, where, what kind of information it tells you. Okay, so that's, uh, you write the onsatz, you try to constrain these CIs. If you have enough information to determine them uniquely, you could say that you're done. But because you made a lot of assumptions, it's probably better to uh, check the answer <laughs> Before, further, before declaring victory. And this can also be used as part of the checks too, because it's a huge amount of information here in principle. 
Uh, but there are other kinds of checks you can make too. And then uh, the way at very high loop orders, the way you get this result, it's stored in a rather nested form. And if you want to actually uh, show that you understand it, you want to say compute, compute it numerically. And uh, that might be by doing some looking at in special limits or special lines, stuff like that. It's uh, actually computationally a bit of a pain sometimes. But uh, all of this, basically, it, uh, the whole point of it is to bypass doing any uh, specific loop integral. Now you kind of have to understand enough about the space of possible loop integrals in order to know what your assumed set of functions is. But once you kind of have this set of functions, you don't have to associate them with any particular loop integral. So that's an advantage. Any uh, questions about the general strategy? So it was sort of first applied to high loop order in the uh, case of uh, n gluon amplitudes. In a very special theory, planar um, n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory. which will be SYM from here on. And I'll define it in a little bit. Um, so the things that it's been possible to bootstrap, uh, say, beyond uh, three loops is uh, n equals 6 and 7. And, and those cases have uh, MHV, which would be two minuses, and then uh, NMHV, which has three minuses, and they don't have to all be next to each other, for example. Could be like that. And then in the seven point case, there might be one more. Uh, but in the, <coughs> as long as you have n less than uh, eight, you don't get NNMHV. That is, you can use parity to relate it to mostly plus case or NMHV. So, so these are uh, true uh, um, n-gluon amplitudes. But then more recently, um, we started looking, thanks to this boundary data from Sever, Tumanoff, and Wilhelm, we started studying uh, form factor. <coughs> which... Um, well, we'll get to it in more detail later, but it, it's actually a lot like the, the way the Higgs boson couples to gluons in the standard model. And um, you can make a um, number of gluons. And the best, num best case is, uh, is n equals 3. And in this case, we could get to L equals 7 and 4 for the six gluon case and the seven gluon case. And here it's even simpler and we can get to eight loops. And also it's a little simpler to describe the function space. So I'm gonna focus on, on uh, this case here, what we call three gluon form factor of an operator, which could be thought of as how the Higgs boson couples to gluons. And um, so those are the cases where we've been able to push it the farthest. But there, there are other, other kinds of applications as well. But I'm going to focus on uh, this example. This, uh, you might say, 
why did you choose such a large number here and here? Why not something smaller? And the answer is that we, we want some variables, kin non-trivial kinematic variables, to be able to move information around from one place in the phase space to another. And uh, it turns out that amplitudes in this planar theory, uh, you might have thought we could do the four gluon amplitude or the five gluon amplitude. But they're uh, constrained by a hidden symmetry. And that symmetry, which only holds in the planar limit, is called dual conformal symmetry. Um, so it constrains these not exactly to vanish, but to uh, basically be totally fixed up to constants. And if everything's fixed up to constants, and we will get our mileage by moving around in the function space, constants are no good. This one's similar. If we had done n equals 2, we would have what we call a two-point form factor. So the kinematics of this is that this object, this operator, can have any momentum. It doesn't have to be light-like. Whereas the gluons, as we were hearing earlier, are taken to be massless. So the momentum of this operator, which I'll just call the Higgs boson because it's more or less the same thing. Uh, it's um, equal to P1 plus P2. And then the uh, Higgs mass squared is pH squared is P1 plus P2 squared. And since they're, that's also 2P1 dot B2 or S12, but that's the only scale in the problem. There's just one scale. Um, everything else is massless. And so this thing might carry some overall dimension, which is maybe uh, depends on the loop order. But th then the next function of the loop order, it only depends on epsilon. And epsilon is the dimensional regularization parameter because of infrared divergences. Yep. Eight loop. The case that we've done eight loops is for this three-point form factor. This one here, it's known to about three, uh, three or four, maybe four loops. So uh, we cheat a little bit when we do it to eight loops. We normalize it in a way that removes all of the divergences. So we know the finite part to eight loops, but we don't actually th know the thing we're normalizing it by because it's closely related to this. We don't know it past four loops. So you have to make things finite in a certain way, and then you lose some information about the uh, sort of bare, bare things. Good question. Any other questions? OK. So. Uh, Let's uh, write down uh, the particle content of n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory. So it has a gluon, which is supposed to be drawn like this. But if I draw it kind of like this, you know, you'll know, you'll know what I mean, right? OK, so that's a, that's a gluon. <laughs> Anything squiggly. Um, and that has helicity plus or minus one. It also carries a color index, which, uh, as uh, Henrik said, is some adjoint label. And then there's a uh, fermion line. In QCD, this fermion would be uh, spin a half and have helicity plus or minus a half. But in this theory, 
we call it a gluino. And there's four of them. And it also has the same uh, color. And then there's a, a scalar. And if you count it as real, uh, there's six real scalars with helicity zero and also in the adjoint. In fact, um, there, there's a supercharge that connects states in the full multiplet. If you remember Pascal's triangle, um, that tells you how the multiplicity works, that it's 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So the 1 is a gluon with plus helicity. And then there are four supercharges in this theory. So A and B, those kind of indices run from 1 to 4. So we say there's a SU4 uh, R symmetry that is sort of part of the bosonic part of the extended superalgebra. And, and when we apply a, a QA, we get uh, the four gluinos, so there's an A index on them. And they would have plus one half helicity. And then we get down to some scalars, phi AB, by applying a second supercharge. Uh, Shruti will probably talk a little bit about this, so I better not go into too much detail. But because an individual QA squared is zero and they, they anti commute, um, the uh, phi BA is um, minus phi AB, and that accounts for why there are six of these. So you can't use the same one twice. It's four choose two, and four choose two is why it's this row of Pascal's triangle. And then there's a GA tilde with a minus helicity that you get from applying a third supercharge. And by the time you apply the fourth one, there's a unique way of applying all four of them. So that's how many you have. And then you get uh, the gluon with negative helicity. So, so this supersymmetry is so big that all the states are in one supermultiplet. So you can rotate uh, amplitudes very efficiently using supersymmetry. And I think Shruti will talk about that tomorrow. So I won't go too much further in that direction. And uh, anyway, as, as she hinted at, the, there's a close connection between these two uh, theories. So the n equals 4 interactions, they sort of contain the QCD interactions in the sense that the basic 3-gluon vertex is exactly the same in both theories. And of course, it's, if it's off-shell, it's sort of gauge invariant gauge dependent, and then there is four gluon vertices, but they would be the same uh, in both theories. And then there's the uh, couplings of quarks to gluons in QCD, and those get replaced by couplings of gluinos uh, to uh, gluons in uh, N equals four. But these are very similar. Kinematically, the vertex is the same. If you use four component notation, the space time dependence of the vertex is just Dirac's gamma matrix. Or if you're doing it in two components, it would be some kind of a sigma matrix. And the same thing is true over here. The only difference is in the color factor. So here you'll get a, a, a TA where this gluon has, um, has index A. And it acts in the fundamental representation, which we often write IJ as some matrix. And in this case over here, there's a, a and then this might be B1 and B2, in the, also in the adjoint. So this would be the generator in the adjoint, which is also called the structure constants. So I think Henrik alluded to this when he said that N equals 4 super Yang Mills is a theory that has only FABCs in it. And that's because these are in the adjoint, and the generator in the adjoint is up to constants, the structure constants. So this is extremely close in, 
If you're, somebody hands you the n equals four tree amplitudes, you can pretty easily uh, extract QCD amplitudes from them. But there are additional vertices because of the scalars that aren't, have no analog in QCD. In particular, well, they have an analog in the standard model. The Higgs is a scalar. And we call interactions that have two fermions in them, like GA and GB, these gluinos, they can couple to phi AB. And we, we call this interaction a Yukawa. Let's go up a little bit for a second. And then the scalars have gauge interactions like this, maybe like this. There are also some four scalar interactions too. Um, so there are some extra ones. And they, combining them all together, they give n equals four super Yang mills a very nice uh, structure. But the main point is that if you have an n gluon amplitude at tree level, there's no way it can contain any matter because the matter is produced from gluons two at a time. It's never, you never make a single matter particle and exchange it. If you did, you might be able to draw it in here. But if you pair produce matter, you have to destroy it again and make a loop. So you can distinguish n equals four and QCD in the n gluon amplitudes at the loop level, but you can't at the tree level. So any identity you can prove in supersymmetry, and Shruti will talk about that tomorrow, I think, it automatically holds, if it's for n gluons, it holds for QCD too. And that explains a lot of the structure of the Park-Taylor amplitudes. But then at the loop level, they start to become uh, quite different beasts. Any questions? Okay, I wanted to say a word about color. Um, Henrik talked a lot about color, but, but it's uh, gonna be very, very simple, even though we're going to the loop level. Um, because we're at uh, large n, we're gonna work at large nc. That's, that's the, uh, what planar in that name of the theory means. Okay, so the, the gauge group is um, SUNC, and we're going to take NC to infinity. So that will uh, simplify our life. The, uh, the adjoint representation has dimension NC squared minus one. And it's uh, in the tensor product of the fundamental representation with the anti-fundamental, except there's a subtraction of a, of a singlet. And what that means is that this uh, gluon propagator, which we draw, there's a color part of that, delta AB, and it can be represented diagrammatically, and this is due to a tuft, long time ago, as a double line in this NC cross NC bar uh, representation. So if we have like a, um, I here, J bar over here, J I bar. Um, so these would be two different indices, I and I bar, and J and J bar propagating along. The minus one subtraction would be that you need to remove a singlet. And you can do that graphically um, with uh, something like this. So, so this would be a delta I uh, J bar, delta uh, J I bar. 
minus uh, one over NC times uh, delta I, I bar delta J, J bar. But if we work at large NC, we can just uh, eliminate this. And when we draw a Feynman diagram with the gluon, we can decorate it with a pair of fundamental lines with the arrows running in opposite directions for NC versus NC bar. And uh, so you might have a tree graph that looks something like this. And you would say, I'm going to consider these adjoint indices to be double fundamental indices, one on each leg that has a has an I and a uh, and the other a barred one, and you could uh, consider uh, J two equals J two bar to be I one. So something like this, and then. Uh, uh, Maybe this is I2 or something. Anyway, you can arrange the color uh, so that, let me make it run this way. You can arrange the color so that these um, <coughs> lines go around the edge of the diagram. And then you can ask what happens when you start to add loops. So now we're going to have. Uh, so there was uh, one, particle one, two, three, four, five. Now we can have a loop diagram like um, so now when we have a leading color configuration, we can draw the same lines around the outside. But every gluon has two lines, so there's another line that goes around the inside. And, and the inside, every time we see a closed loop, we can put an NC in it. Because these lines here, they're propagating a fundamental index around, and when it comes back, you get to trace over the fundamental of uh, the identity matrix, or you can write it as delta ii, and this has an implicit summation from i equals 1 to nc. So every time you get one of these closed loops, you get a factor of nc. But if I drew a different diagram, one that was non-planar, So here's the same final, the same external states, one to five. But now I've crossed over these lines here. So this is an inherently non-planar graph. And you have the same lines running around here. But then when you try to come in here, there's like no way to make uh, a uh, two, two uh, NCs. You might be able to get one NC out of this, but probably wouldn't work quite Right. Anyway, so so this is uh, does not give you the chance to get the maximum number of NCs. So the general conclusion is that any non-planar uh, Feynman diagram is subleading an, N an NC. So we just need to look at the planar diagrams. You notice that. We added on two loops here, and compared with tree level, we had extra vertices, and so we had an extra g yang mill squared and an nc, in this case, uh, raised to the uh, l equals 2 power. So the, the real loop counting parameter in planar n equals 4 is called the atuft parameter. Uh, the Atuft coupling. So you usually hold lambda fixed 
as you take uh, uh, nc to infinity. So you can take, um, kind of hold this fixed. Now, often in this uh, literature, it's useful to get rid of some pies. And so there's a convention where something called g squared, this is especially from the integrability uh, community, which we connect tightly to. Just put a 16 pi squared down here. So that you'll often see. Uh, And so we'll usually write some amplitude and indicate its g squared dependence by uh, writing it as a, a sum of, uh, actually, let me do one other thing. The, uh, when you remove these factors of NC, the remaining group theory factor, which I've indicated with these lines going out around the outside, is very similar to a tree level. And we know that at tree level, there is this single trace representation. So the n-gluon tree amplitude, um, as a function of the external adjoint indices and this coupling g squared, can be written as uh, sum over the loop order, g squared to the l, and then a trace uh, TA1, well, maybe I'll put sigma 1 to uh, TA sigma n times um, something that contains the, uh, the uh, loop order dependence and no more, and just depends on the momenta. So, um, this is, should have a sum, and you usually sum over uh, in the trace basis, Sn mod Zn or Sn minus 1. Okay, so this is a combined uh, loop expansion definition where we put the loop order upstairs here in parentheses and a uh, <coughs> uh, color decomposition. And it's basically the same as tree level. It shouldn't be, it should be much more complicated, but because we're in the planar limit, the leading terms just amount to pulling out a factor of NC with each uh, Yang mill squared. And so we've buried that into this definition, G squared. Any questions about that? Yep. Uh, yeah, I should put in an overall factor. Thank you. Let me pull out a factor, and here it's better to just use GYM to the N minus 2. Right, good catch. Yep. large n limit, but yeah. I, I guess it actually decouples in pure adjoint theory anyhow, right? Because Yeah, you want, that's right. You in the case coupling. that there are only adjoints, um, every one of these propagators, it's going to run into an adjoint vertex. And that vertex is a trace of a commutator. And this... Uh, This identity, kind of, if you, if you use it inside here as one of the ones in the commutator, well, the identity matrix has vanishing commutators. So you can kill it that way, too. Any other questions? Uh, it's one at a time. <laughs> so
So when did I start? How much more time do I have? Okay, great. Yeah, so originally I was going to do one loop integral, but then I decided loop inter even one loop integrals are hard, and I'm just going to tell you what the answer is. So the uh, integral we're going to look at because it's uh, related to our, the form factor that we're going to spend the most time on is an integral that looks like this. And this is a shorthand for um, this leg here. When you draw two massless legs coming in, it, it means that there's an arbitrary mass here, which we could think of as the mass of the Higgs squared, for example. But these single legs coming out, and uh, we'll just take them to be massless. So this thing is often called a, a one mass uh, box integral. And uh, maybe you can normalize it in different ways. Um, maybe to simplify the answer, you could put a, so, so we're going to do it in dimensional regularization because it has infrared uh, divergences. And uh, we can pull out some powers of 4 pi. And it has an integral over the 4 minus 2 epsilon dimensional loop integration measure. And then it has um, four propagators shown here. So this could be P. And then I usually take the P's to be outgoing, say P1, P minus P1, and so on. Okay, so that's the uh, box integral, and uh, standard thing to do is to either Schwinger or Feynman parameterize it. So uh, you can rewrite the um, inter the one over p squared as a integral dt i e to the minus t i p i squared, where p i squared stands for these four guys. After you do that, you get a Gaussian integral because it becomes e to the minus some quadratic form in the integration measure p. So you can do the, the Gaussian integral, and you can also, uh, uh, it's often, so the uh, Schwinger parameter is called ti. And Feynman introduced parameters too, and they're related by uh, scaling out an overall um, Schwinger parameter, which can be done more easily. And uh, after doing those steps, you get um, um, something like gamma 2 plus epsilon. And then uh, integral 0 to 1 over four Feynman parameters, but actually you've sort of used one to scale it out. So there's a uh, projective condition that they all add up to one. All right. And then after a bit of algebra, you get And then you can actually do the Feynman parameter integrals 
they, they diverge, so, uh, but I'm not going to do them here. Um, there's some overall factor in terms of gamma functions of epsilon. And then there's some overall power here. And the divergent part carries a little epsilonic dimension. This is one half log squared of uh, S12 over S23. And then there's some extra. <coughs> okay, so, so this is like a basic box integral, integral, and I write it down because, first of all, it kind of exposes the basic infrared divergences that you get in any loop amplitude. At one loop, when you have massless external states, you always get 1 over epsilon squared. And that's because you can have both soft and collinear divergences. This momentum can be very small, very soft, and it can be exchanged at a long distance between these two hard momenta. But it could also be somewhat aligned with either this one or this one, the neighboring ones, and those all cause divergences. And because they're of two types, soft and collinear, you get the, these uh, double poles in the regulation parameter epsilon. And they're sort of associated with, with the adjacent kinematic variables uh, because the soft one cares about which direction these two legs are going relative to each other. That's why you get some dependence here. And then at the finite order, you get these uh, uh, dilogarithms and um, the uh, definition of the die logarithm is, um, well, first let me write down uh, Li1 of x. Is minus the logarithm of 1 minus x. And that's actually the integral 0 to x of dt over 1 minus t. And I write it that way because then I can uh, expand this out in a Taylor series. And integrate term by term. So this t, this 1 will become a t, t squared over 2, t cubed over 3. So I have an expansion for the logarithm which is um, the sum of k equals 1 to infinity of x to the k over k. That's a standard uh, Taylor result. But now we're going to define the uh, die logarithm to be the integral dt over t of li1. Of, the, of minus the logarithm of 1 minus x. And you can repeat the same thing. Whoops, this should be depending on t. So you can plug in the series expansion here and integrate it dt over t. And that will uh, <coughs> give you a t to the k, but it, it will bring, bring down another power of k. So you have a series representation x to the k over k squared. And if we want, we can also define lin of x by integrating dt over t again of lin minus 1 of t. 
and that has the series expansion x to the k over k to the n. So all of these uh, functions have the same uh, behavior in the x plane. They are, this, this series converges for any x with a magnitude less than one, but starting at x equals one, it diverges, and there's actually a branch cut. We know that log of one minus x, as soon as x is bigger than one, the argument of the logarithm is negative and we get a branch cut. And then these other ones, we're just integrating dt over t of that discontinuity. And that gives us a discontinuity for the higher weight one. So, so they all have branch cuts out here too. So uh, are there any questions about this? I, uh, I, th I think er I uh, earlier defined, you know, S12 as the square in the two-point form factor. But just to be clear, let me, let me uh, review the kinematics again, that we have these um, three, three momenta, P1 plus T, P2 plus P3, and they uh, equal minus P Higgs. And uh, when we square it, we define S123 to be uh, P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared. We could call it M Higgs squared if we want, but here I'm just going to use that. But because these all have vanishing uh, P squared, PI squared, we just pick up the cross, we can rewrite this using the cross terms. So there's a second <laughs> equation that we'll be using a lot, which looks like this. Now there are some divergent terms that are kind of unbalanced. They should probably be un there's probably some scale mu we should have put in. But the uh, finite terms, they all depend on dimensionless ratios. And so we should uh, maybe define some variables that are uh, <coughs> made out of dimensionless ratios. So we're going to define u to be s12 over s123 and uh, v to be s23 over s123 and w to be s31 over s123. So they're not all independent. W can be eliminated using this relation. So this relation comes from this relation. If we just take this relation and divide by S123, then you see it's the same as U plus V plus W equals 1. So there's only uh, two variables here. In, this, uh, in these kinematic formulas. So this would be uh, 1 over u and 1 over v, and this would be like u over v. So we're going to use those variables uh, uh, going forward. And uh, there's also uh, some, uh, maybe I'll do the um, other part a little later. So I wanted to explain the connection to uh, <clears throat> the relation to the real world, which has is through the um, <clears throat> production of the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider. And it's closely connected to the qu kind of thing we're computing in the n equals 4 case. Not in quantitative detail, but spiritually. 
and then maybe I'll stop for the day. So, so the, the Higgs boson is the origin of mass. So it talks the most strongly to particles that have the most mass. However, none of those particles are found inside the proton because it's a pretty light hadron. It has up and down quarks in it and gluons. But gluons talk to top quarks, and the top quark talks to the Higgs boson through this uh, diagram. So um, we can have two gluons coming in, and we can produce the, uh, the Higgs boson because this Yukawa coupling, lambda top, is of order one. If we tried to make up, anti-up, make the Higgs, it'd be a disaster because the Yukawa coupling of the up is smaller than the Yukawa coupling of the top by the ratio of the up quark mass of uh, maybe two MeV divided by uh, the mass of the top quark, which is 175 GeV. So if you try, you can't you can't make the Higgs colliding the quarks and the proton, but you can collide the gluons, and there are a lot of gluons in the proton, especially at small momentum fraction, which is enough at the Large Hadron Collider. So anyway, there's this diagram to compute. And you can do a one-loop diagram and keep it as a function of the top mass. And, uh, but, but actually, because the uh, Higgs mass is now known to be very close to 125 GeV, and the top quark mass is 175, but what's more relevant for assessing the kinematics is twice the mass of the top, because the first cut opens up here when you're at twice the mass of the top, and that's twice 175 GeV, that's 350 GeV. And most of the time, these kinematic things come in squared because kinematic invariants are naturally squares of things. So, so MH squared over uh, 4M top squared is about, you know, roughly a ninth or something. So it's a pretty small parameter. So we can imagine taking the limit uh, MT goes to infinity. And when we do that, it's like saying that the top quark is too heavy to propagate very far. And so this loop integral isn't really distributed very much. It should really be all shrunk to one point. And so there should be a local operator that, with a certain coefficient um, c. Um, so some coefficient c and then times h, and then something involving the, the gluon field strengths. Uh, and you need to write down something gauge invariant. And it should spit out two gluons. And your only option is to write this down. So, <coughs> so at heavy uh, top mass, and this C has a, um, on dimensional grounds, it should have a 1 over V. And then there's some number I forget. Okay, so we can approximately replace this vertex, this one loop uh, interaction by a local vertex. And this is the leading operator. And if you want to expand to higher orders than one over m top squared, you can write down higher dimension operators. And that's how people do the precision calculation of the Higgs cross section at the uh, LHC. And uh, what we're gonna talk about is form factors in planar n equals four of this, of this operator. And we're just gonna give them momentum, but it's just as if there were like a Higgs interacting. But in, uh, in, in the planar n equals four case, um, this uh, belongs to, this operator belongs to a uh, n equals four supermultiplet. So if we want, we can choose different representations of it, and it doesn't really uh, matter. We could choose a, a case that spits out two scalars if we wanted, or two gluinos, and then we would consider different matrix elements. But we're gonna, we'll call this thing O, so we're gonna consider matrix elements of O with uh, plane wave states of 
of three gluons. And um, we, as I was hinting before, we, we could have done an operator with just two gluons, but that's too trivial because it kinematically can only depend on um, um, s to some power times uh, some function of epsilon. It doesn't have enough scales in it. This, this one has uh, these kinematic scales of uh, dimensionless ratios, two of them, u and v. So I think I've probably uh, gone on for about long enough, and it's time to take any last questions for the day, if you guys still have energy. Yeah, there's a question. I mean, when you write the C, H, F, Ah, sorry. Yeah. V, v is the VEV of the Higgs field. So in some conventions, V is, is like 246 uh, GV. Yeah, it's not this V. Yeah. yeah. So that's a result of doing this loop integral. OK, next, next question. Yeah, and just <clears throat> at the beginning of your lecture, you mentioned that you have done up to eight loop uh, of this yeah. Higgs to, but the other one is like up to three to four loop. Uh, I yeah. would imagine the second one, let's say with two gluons, would be naively simpler than the first one with three gluons. Yeah. So what's the reason why you can do <laughs> eight loop there? Well, partly we cheat by dividing out a divergent part. And that divergent part is essentially the two gluon one. Oh, so, okay. so we normalize it by the thing that we don't know as well. That Makes that's sense. how we uh, do it. Okay, thank you. There's yeah, there's other ways to nor there are different ways to normalize these things, and we kind of uh, we normalize by a divergent quantity that we don't know, but it's closely connected to the two gluon one. It has some of the same constants in it. We might have another constant or two uh, that just disappears in the normalization too. And then in the n gluon amplitudes, there's also uh, there, there's a fancy way to normalize things that is used by our friends who calculate the operator product expansion. I didn't explain this yet, but, but uh, these n gluon amplitudes, they are dual to uh, Wilson loops. So like this six gluon one, um, so you have a, a bunch of momenta here, and according to the uh, uh, momentum conservation condition, if you add up, if you consider these to be now uh, vectors between different uh, points here, um, so the closure of this contour, if these vectors are the momenta, that's momentum conservation. That when you add up all the vectors, you get zero. But you can do a calculation where you don't do, uh, you don't let the gluons run off to infinity, but instead you do a path ordered exponential. And when you expand out this exponential, that corresponds to emitting gluons off of this contour. So this is called a, uh, a polygonal um, Wilson loop. And uh, so it's some kind of path ordered exponential um, integral e to the i a dot x around this contour c. And the interesting thing about this duality is that infrared divergences from very long distance gluons emitted exchange between the outgoing gluons, they map into very short distance gluons that are renormalizing this singularity where two lines meet. So uh, there's a clever way of removing the divergences from this picture where you take a hexagon and you take one corner and you find a light-like leg that goes over here. And then you do the same thing over here. And then you take this hexagon and you put a truncated pentagon that comes from removing this side. And another 
truncated pentagon from this, and then you put back a square from this. And I'll leave it as a homework exercise for you to notice that all these corners get canceled one place or another. And so this cancels all the divergences. But first you have to transform it to this other picture. So that's another way to make these things finite. And it kind of also removes all the information about the lower point stuff. So you learn about the finite parts of the more complicated stuff and you don't learn about the divergent lower point stuff. Okay, more questions? Okay, it's getting late, so let's thank uh, Lance again. Yeah, and we are done for today. We meet tomorrow at 9.